right. Hello, everyone. And thank you for joining us for our discussion on heat pumps. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, Julie Malazzi from Quincy Climate Action Network. Julie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and to the library for hosting us tonight. Um, and welcome everyone to Heat Pumps 101. Um, we're really excited to have this uh, event tonight. I wanted to, uh, first of all, thank our partners, the Thomas Crane Public Library, Massachusetts Green Energy, Consumers Alliance, and Quincy Asian Resources. Um, we've all been really gracious and helpful uh, with the event. Quincy Climate Action Network is uh, a local group that acts to fight climate change locally by trying to encourage climate-friendly practices among residents, business, and government. Um, so an event like this is really right in line with what our mission is, uh, because we believe that individual decisions that we make, such as what heating system to heat our house, can really have a big impact on uh, climate, you know, on the reduction of uh, carbon impact and therefore helping prevent climate change, change from getting worse than it already is. Um, so uh, I will go ahead and uh, let you know the format of the event and introduce our speakers and then um, we'll can, we can get started. Um, so we have with us tonight, Larry Creation, who is executive director. You wanna just maybe give us a quick wave. Larry Creation is executive director of the Green Energy Consumers Alliance. And he will be presenting along with Loie Hayes, who is the membership coordinator, coordinator of the Green Energy Consumers Alliance. We have uh, Will Zarigo, who is a manager at I ICF which is a program implementer under the umbrella of MassSave. Um, probably many of you have heard of MassSave um, and they are helping to implement the program that gives rebates for heat pumps. Um, and lastly, we have John Gorey. Give us a wave, John. John is a fellow QCAM member and a homeowner who has recently installed heat pumps and also researched and wrote an article for the Boston Globe about heat pumps. So he's gonna be sharing both the homeowner perspective and some of the research he's done. Um, so the basic the format is quite simple. Um, I'm going to pose some questions and different panelists will answer them. Um, and then at the end, there'll be a Q&A. All right, well, we'll just love to start right off with the basics. What is a heat pump and what are the different types of heat pumps? And we'll have Will, uh, Will Dario start out for us. Sure thing. All right. Hello, everyone. So yeah, today, that's what we'll try to do. We'll try to answer this question. What is a heat pump? Um, it's pretty straightforward, actually. It, kind of does what it says, right? It pumps heat and it, it can move it from hot to cold and cold to hot. So at your home, if you're looking, you have one, right? You've got a refrigerator. You've got the outside, it's in the room. Inside, it's cold. Well, so now you're pumping heat out of the refrigerator into the house and vice versa. Um, a heat pump can do both. It can move in both directions. So for your house, um, you know, you get a benefit of air conditioning. So if also, if you have a window air conditioner, it's the same principle. It's basically moving some air from that inside to the outside. Um, there's obviously a lot of different types and it can get kind of technical. We're gonna try to stick to the basics today though, but um, it uses pretty straightforward technology too. Again, a refrigerator, they've been around for a long time. Um, now there's a lot more control with these and they've just been getting better and better. If you wanna jump to the next slide. So the types of heat pumps, here you can see there's um, you know, kind of these images, right? You see what there is. In some of your homes, you might have ductwork. So there's a system that can kind of cover that on the left-hand side. In other homes, you might have cast iron radiators. You might have boilers that run along the, the floor kind of carrying water through them. That one in the middle can kind of replace that type of system. And then if you've got all kinds of things going on, um, in some homes, you might actually have, like I mentioned, the baseboard along the floor and then ductwork as well uh, to deliver sign up, um, some air conditioned cool air, you can kind of mix that up with the, the ty type of systems you see here on the right. Um, there's also a lot of reasons why they're set up in different ways, but in old homes, you might have some framing where you can't really put ductwork in, or you might have a, um, you know, you might be between floors and like a triple decker. And again, you really can't sneak ductwork in there. So lots of ways to use heat pumps in any home. How about the environmental benefits? This is one of you know my big motivations, but we I have a personal goal to try to make our household net zero by 2030. Um, electric car would be in the mix and uh, something like an electric heat pump. Um, so uh, Larry and Loie, could you talk to us about the environmental benefits and um, about green energy sourcing, which I imagine is part of that? 
Yes, uh, thank you. Um, as a lifelong Quincy resident, I'm very glad to be here. Um, this slide shows the benefits of a heat pump for heating your home. Um, and what it shows is, is the, the reality is that uh, most people will heat their home with natural gas. Um, a lot of people still heat with oil. Um, in rural areas, some people might have propane. Um, a few people still have electric baseboard. Now, that's not a heat pump. That's electric resistance heating that is very inefficient and uh, very expensive to have. The cost of the electricity bill is pretty high if you have that. And if you have national grid, like those of us in Quincy do, if you were to have a 2,000 square foot home, which is kind of average, what you can see is that the uh, greenhouse gas emissions, those are the ones that cause global warming or climate change. Um, they are highest with electric baseboard then oil is right up there. Propane, natural gas is pretty high. But then from there, you can see a big drop off. When you go to a air source heat pump, which is the kind that Will was just talking about, or to a ground source heat pump, you get huge reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Now that is if you were to get your electricity uh, supply from National Grid. And over time, though, what this slide does not show is that um, every year, by law, National Grid's power supply has to get cleaner. There's a standard that they have to meet every year. And so if you look at the air source heat pump bar, it says 2.1. That's metric tons of emissions per year. That's going to go down every year because of state law. But the oil, propane, and natural gas numbers are never going to change. They're always going to be so if we want to reduce our emissions at home, this is a way to do that. Um, next slide, please. Now, um, some people, I do and uh, many others do, can uh, purchase 100% uh, electricity that comes from wind, solar, or hydro, which have zero emissions. And very soon, I would say by November, I think, uh, Quincy will be part of a program uh, called uh, Quincy, uh, Quincy Community uh, Energy Aggregation. Quincy, and if you go to that website, quincycea.com, uh, you'll see more information where we're going to get an electricity supply that is significantly cleaner than what National Grid Supply is. And it'll give you the chance also to uh, purchase, if you want, for a little bit more you can purchase 100% uh, electricity that comes from wind, solar, and hydro. So here's what the magic is with that. You would have zero emissions if you had electric resistance, but that would be expensive. It's just a very expensive way to heat your home. If you had oil or propane or natural gas to heat your home, your emissions are still gonna be very high. But look at, now look at the little bars on the right-hand side. You get heat pumps, an air source heat pump, or a ground source heat pump, your emissions will be zero. And so that works the same way with an electric car. You can heat your home and you can have an electric car, zero emissions if you electrify them. That's the, the point of tonight's story, which is why we're involved with this, with um, Quincy uh, Climate Action. Uh, next slide. And that will be Lowy. Yeah, I can speak to a little bit about the operating costs of a heat pump. Now, remember that an operating cost is not the purchase price. This is just the, the cost every year to power your heating equipment. So this compares, again, the same four conventional heating fuels, the electric baseboard, the oil, propane, and natural gas. And then in the green bars, you have the air source heat pump, the ground source heat pump, and the automated wood heat. Uh, this is um, a slide. This data comes from the Mass Clean Energy Center, and uh, they have an automated wood heat program. And so they include this data as well, although it's not very common. <clears throat> so in this slide, you'll see that at this point, um, natural gas is considered to be less expensive to operate, to heat your home with natural gas 
than an air source heat pump would be. But I want to remind you that this uh, chart is based on certain assumptions about what the cost is per unit of heat. So for instance, the gas price assumed in this chart is $1.48 and the electricity is 23 cents per kilowatt. The gas is per therm. Uh, the oil price in this chart is, is they use the figure $2.33. And if you've been buying heating oil lately, you know it's considerably higher than that now. So take these data uh, with a grain of salt and be sure when you're considering buying a heat pump to look at the most current information about how much each of these uh, sources cost. Um, but generally you can assume that electric baseboard will be the most expensive, propane will be the next most expensive, oil, and then it's somewhat of a toss up between natural gas and heat pumps depending on the current price of natural gas and electricity. Uh, I think we're ready to move on to the next slide. Uh, so that slide, this slide here shows um, what Massachusetts has for a plan. Um, heat pumps are gonna be an essential part of what's called the Massachusetts Clean Energy and Climate Plan. Uh, the state governor Baker's office has set a goal of having heat pumps in 1 million homes by 2030, which is basically eight years from now, if you think about it. Um, if you look at, that means that we need to install over 100,000 heat pumps in people's homes per year. Uh, but if you look at the chart, we've been bumping along um, with just a few thousand heat pumps per year. Uh, so uh, we really need, as a, as a state, we need to pick up the pace in order to reach the state's climate goals. We need to reduce emissions. The state's by law has to reduce emissions 50% by 2030 and heat pumps are gonna be a big part of it. And so this gets back to what Julie said was, you know, the state can have a plan but it really is going to depend upon uh, people like us to make these choices uh, in our homes. And so just to show you how steep that curve is, that green line is a projection of what we're going to have to do. The blue bars are what's in the current plan for mass save. And I think in a little bit, Loey will talk about what the incentives that mass save will offer. Thanks. Great. I'd love to invite our um, homeowner, John Gorey, to talk a little bit about how, do, how does the heat and AC feel with a heat pump? Because remember, it is not just a heater, it's also an air conditioner. Um, so how's it gone for you? That's right. We, um, we had ours installed in October, so we haven't really tried out the air conditioning. But that is very exciting to us because we have radiators. We don't have ductwork, so we've never had central air in our house before. So that was an, you know, an appealing little side effect. Our main ambition was to to move our heat as much as possible away from uh you know, heating with gas and, and oil um and so far it's been really nice it's quieter than i expected we have um it's as you can see it's circled in red right there it just sort of tucks into uh the corner of the room um it's it's really whisper quiet inside and that's the indoor unit this is a what's called a mini split uh there are refrigerant lines that go down the side of the house to a bigger outdoor unit, which is not that noisy either. It sounds like somebody's air conditioner in summer, you know, outside the house. Um, it keeps the house at a really consistent temperature, which has been nice. Like uh, we have steam radiators is our normal heat. And when the radiators come on, it gets boiling hot for a little while. There's lots of banging and hissing. And uh, I mean, at the same time, we've lived with those for like over a decade now and i love steam heat it's very uh bone soaking you know like you are just enveloped in warmth and the heat pump doesn't necessarily deliver that same kind of heat 
But I think if you're used to having forced hot air, you wouldn't really notice any difference at all. Um, it's also um, been really good, even on the very, very cold days, like last week when it was like negative eight degrees or not eight, negative eight, uh, just regular eight. Um, we turned on the steam heat just in the morning for like 45 minutes to kind of give the house a little bit of a, of a bump up. And then the heat pump was able to sort of maintain it for the whole rest of the day. And this is because we only have this one unit. It's actually, I don't know if you're looking at me, but it's right behind me. And this is just in the living and dining area of our house. It's just this one little blower. So, you know, it, it's not meant to heat our bedrooms kind of at the other end of the house and stuff like that. It really has all the way through November, December, and early January. But on the very coldest days, I'll sometimes give uh, the steam heat a, another go at it. And we also have a wood stove. And if we really feel like getting cozy and hot, we'll light a fire there. Um, let me see. What else was I supposed to tell you about? Do you want to go to the next slide? Oh, and I'll tell you yeah, about Yeah, I was going to ask you a little bit about the installation costs, how it went for you and the kind of timeline of how, how long that took. Sure. So um, we own a, we own a two family house, a double decker. Uh, we got one heat pump per unit. So each one has one exterior unit and one inside blower. Um, they're both in the main, you know, it's the same layout up and down. So they're both in the, in the main living area. And that cost for us, it was about uh, 9,500 per unit um, before the rebates, which we've applied for. And there's a backlog. We haven't you know, seen the rebate come in yet, but hopefully there should be a few hundred dollars coming back. Uh, we heat with natural gas originally, which is not as good of a rebate uh, and maybe doesn't even exist in the next round of rebates uh, compared to if you heat with oil. It's a, a much more lucrative rebate, which um, you guys will talk about. Um, it took us about we got the quotes in August and then like we applied for uh, a heat loan, which is a 0% loan you can get. Um, that took a few days. Uh, and then once we scheduled it, you know, once we contacted the plumbers and, and asked them to schedule it, it only took about three weeks till they were able to come and do it. And the whole thing took like three days. Um, as you can see on this slide, uh, Mass Clean Energy Center has done some research about how much people are paying for them. Um, the average cost back in like 2018, 2019 was about 10,800 for the median sized heat pump in the Boston area. And they say that prices have risen since then, which is you know true for just about everything. Um, and Mass CEC also did a pilot program last year uh, or 2020, that's not last year anymore. Um, of trying to get people to, to adopt whole, whole home heat pump systems, which are, um, you know, they tap into your existing ductwork or it's enough firepower to heat your whole house, no other backup required anymore. Uh, and the cost of that was on average about 20,000 to retrofit it into an existing older home. Uh, it was lower for new construction and for gut rehabs. Um, and there was, they have a, a few case studies. Uh, there was a, you know, a, a similar to ours, a, a top floor condo in Salem in like an 1800s two family. Uh, and they got a, a really huge whole home heat pump installed that tapped into their ductwork and they never needed their gas boiler again. And that cost about $12,000 before the rebates. Great. Thank you. Um, I know we have a lot of questions in the chat, which we'll circle back to at the end, but I did see one going by that maybe you could just answer real quickly if you have the numbers handy. Um, if, you've, uh, if you could speak to what changes you've seen in your in your heating bill um, since you installed do you are you able to speak to that yeah so um we actually and this is a pretty if you want to get into the weeds a pretty good case study we have you know like i mentioned we live on the top floor we had our tenant um heat exclusively with her heat pump in november and then when we first saw the electric bill it was kind of shocking it was a lot because i've realized it wasn't really a lot. It's just that I'm not used to our electric bill varying so dramatically. I'm accustomed to a gas bill that comes in in December is $250 after being 12, you know, like it, and that doesn't surprise me. So, but when the, when the electric bill went from like a hundred dollars to like 258 or something, I was like, Oh geez. And then I told her to start maybe heating with gas in December. And so we have the same living space, uh, the same tenant, uh, heating with the two different methods, one, the heat pump in November and 
the, the gas heat in December. Um, in November, her electric bill, the, the extra electric was $182 for the heat. Um, and in December, using the gas boiler, her extra gas bill was $251. And if you divided it out by the, there's a technical thing called your heating degree days, which is like how much heat energy you need to maintain a house given the weather outside. Uh, it actually ended up being just slightly cheaper uh, with the electric heat pump. Um, they are more efficient in milder weather, weather than they are in the deep cold. So take that with a grain of salt. Although we also, we pay extra in electric to get a hundred percent renewable. So our electric bill is naturally even higher. So a, a regular customer might not see it that high. So, it's, right. it's, so even, even with a hundred percent renewable electricity, your cost to heat per degree was less with this pump than with gas. Is what yeah, I'm slightly less. Yeah. So that's, that's great to hear. Okay. I guess we should go ahead and move on. I'm going to ask Larry and Loey to speak um, to the in incentive programs that are out there. Yeah, I can take this one. Um, so you want to pay attention to the word proposed in this headline, mass save proposed incentives. Um, the uh, mass save program has to uh, create a plan for every three years. And right now they've proposed the plan that begins in, in this month, but it still uh, has to be approved by the Department of Public Utilities. So on uh, the, at, by the end of January, we should know whether these proposed incentives have been approved or not. But what is proposed is actually very exciting. Um, uh, John mentioned the case study of a whole home heat pump. And that is an instance where the fossil fuel system has been completely replaced by a heat pump. There's no need to continue to have that, that gas or oil or propane heater in the house. And in fact, you have to sign an affidavit saying that your heat pump has been designed to provide 100% of your heating needs. Um, so this is a whole home heat pump incentive, if, a pat, if approved by the DPU, would be $10,000 per home. And this is a significant increase, uh, particularly for the average size home and the small sized homes. In the past, or to date, the mass save rebate has been based on how big your heat pump system is. And the bigger your home, the bigger the heat pump system and the bigger the incentive. For a small home, it was a fairly small incentive. Now, if you're doing your whole home, even if it's a small home or a moderate sized home, you'll get that $10,000. So this is a very significant rebate. Um, the partial um, proposal is still the same as it has been in the past, $1,250 per ton of heating capacity. Heat pump sizes are measured in heating capacity per ton. And the average home might use um, a three or a four ton system. Um, in John's case, he has a, I think he said a 2.5 tons uh, uh, unit, but it only provides part of his heat. Um, now, if you're going to have, like John, uh, your old system and the heat pump at the same time, in order to get the rebate, you need to have what is called an integrated control. It's basically, think of it as a thermometer or a thermostat that's connected to both your heat pump and your legacy heating system, your old heating system. And the, the, that one thermostat allows your heat to toggle one or the other at a certain point, you might say at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, you want your heat pump to turn off and you want your gas system or your oil system to turn on. And that's what an integrated control allows you to do. And the rebate 
pays for a good percentage of the cost of the integrated controls. Now, the big question that we are waiting to hear what the DPU will decide is, will this whole home incentive, and in fact, will the partial home incentive apply to the displacement of gas heat? As John said, he has not yet seen his rebate from MassSave, and he's not anxious about that or expecting it to be very large because he has gas heat and the incentive right now for gas heat is not very large um, on the order of 150 or $300 per ton um, compared to this 1250 per ton for the partial displacement. So that would be a big change in the mass save program if it is approved by the DPU uh, when they make their decision this month. So look for that information later this month. Um, uh, a couple other things to note, there is a larger incentive for ground source heat pumps. These are also called geothermal. And this is where the, um, instead of grabbing the heat from the air outside your home, it grabs the heat from the ground outside your home. That's a ground source heat pump or a geothermal heat pump. They are more expensive to install, and so the incentive is larger. Now, you see here the whole home air to water heat pump. That is primarily at this point only applic applicable to homes with radiant floor heating. So if you have radiant floor heating in your home, you could potentially get a heat pump to um, heat that floor instead of your current uh, fossil fuel system. And there is a rebate for that. This is a brand new technology, this air to water heat pump. And I know a lot of people would like to be able to replace their uh, baseboard heat or their steam radiators with a heat pump that would heat the water that goes into that baseboard or into that radiator. That is not commercially available in the United States or at least in Massachusetts at this point. Um, there, there is no one that I know of who's installing a heat pump that could heat your home using your radiators or your baseboard uh, at this point. So I'm sorry to disappoint you on that if you're looking for that. Um, and you should note there is potentially a federal tax credit of up to $300, but you really should talk with your tax accountant about that because um, it, it's not exactly clear um, who can take that and who can't, uh, but you could look into that. And that's all for incentives right. at this point. Thank you. I mean, it just to uh, if, uh, tell me if I'm reading this right. If the whole home incentive does get to be ten thousand dollars, and John just said that the uh, cost a year or two ago was uh, around ten thousand five hundred or something, maybe it's more now. But that's am I right that then the the subsidy could cover most of the cost of this? Yes. Is that yes? Is that now, I, in, okay? Now just in to his make sure house, it's not too good to be true. <laughs> in in his house, um, uh, because he has gas heat, um it might not apply to his house at all. But if you are heating with oil in a relatively small house like John's, um, you may actually be able to get an incentive that pays for a large percentage of the, uh, of the, of the heat pump installation cost. That's, that's amazing. Okay. And, and save the planet too. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Um, all right. So I'm going to invite um, Jason uh, Darrow from, um, um, blanking on the ICF oh, yes. to, to talk with us about the installation uh, process. I'll, I'll end up covering that. I don't think Jason was able to make it, so I can I can certainly speak to it. Thank you. Sure. So when we talk about the design and the install process, we're really thinking about a lot of different things. Um, every home is so unique. Um, and I know that one of the questions was kind of speaking to like a triple decker, you know, if you're living on something like that. Um, in other homes, you might have, you know, uh, let's say you're in a cape and you've got split zones there. So you got two stories. Um, you might live in a ranch, so it's one story. 
we want to basically think through that install and make sure you know the the systems are set up that it's going to deliver air to each room. Um, there might be a case where you have a bathroom that might not get it 100%, but there's so many strategies to kind of mitigate uh, any kind of issue that could come up from that. When you're looking at this screen, um, you can see that there's the different zones that we talked about. You might have rooms that are kind of isolated off to a corner there. Um, but again, you can always have a, a multi-split type system. So in the bottom right there, you can kind of see the outdoor unit um, on that outside wall by the stairs. You really sometimes can get away with just one of those outdoor units and then have three indoor units. Um, lots of strategies there. The one thing we wanna kind of make sure again, people understand too, is that the system should really be right sized. And I believe on our next slide, we can talk about that. So again, when it comes to making choices with these different systems, you really actually want to think about weatherizing the home first. So that's the first step, basically reducing the amount of heat or cooling you need to bring into the house or remove from it. Um, so we'll talk about, we talked about kind of those incentives there. Another one that's available through MassSave is having a home energy assessment. So you can have an energy auditor come in at no cost and they can walk through your house. They'll look up in your attic. They'll see if you have uh, enough insulation in there and they can make recommendations to add some. Um, you know, there's always a uh, air sealing that could take place. Again, it's something they can look up in your, your attic space or um, even in your walls. They could blow insulation in from the outside. So that's almost... That's, I mean, that's not almost, <laughs> that is always step one, kind of figuring yeah, out and what would you have. mind, um, Would you mind reminding people where they go to get the, this? because we've had this done twice and it's not only is the assessment free, but there was a huge subsidy for all the insulation and there was a lot done, even the attic door was, you know, insulated and it saves us a ton of money in heating costs and it was more than half covered. It, was that through MassSave? It is, absolutely, yep. So you can head right to MassSave.com. Uh, it's M, it's MassSave, it's, it's two words, but they're all jumbled together. So there's three S's in there. Uh, so MassSave.com and you'll see home energy assessments. It's pretty much usually at the top of the page under the residential section. So again, yeah, you schedule it. Right now they've been great about doing even virtual assessments. So if you know, you're, you're unable to kind of do something right away, they're able to kind of schedule in slots even sooner by doing a video walkthrough of your home. So that's going to do a lot of things. It's going to improve your comfort at the house. And then how that relates to the heat pump, it's going to allow you to use a smaller, less expensive system. Um, it's also going to kind of help. When we talked about those zones. If the house is uh, you know, um, weatherized and, and you get some more insulation in there, you won't necessarily have to have a head in every room or, or ducts hitting every spot. Um, the heat will be able to kind of move throughout the house a little bit more um, efficiently. It will, it will be more efficient in that sense. Um, and again, with all those different applications that we have that we showed in our previous slide, you've got the ducted type, you've got the head type, you even have ones that mount low on the wall, um, lots of options. So definitely a, a lot of choices that we can, we can recommend. Okay, great. Um, is that uh... We're, okay, so we, I, I've seen a lot of questions going by, um, and there's a lot that have been posted in the chat. Gina from QCAN is curating a question list based on ones that weren't covered. We'll start with those. And some, a lot of questions were also answered in the chat. If we have time, I'll read out some of the answers for those of you who don't like multitasking like crazy. Um, so why don't we, um, I'll start with this uh, question from Jack Chan. And, uh, and I'll just let any of the presenters, whoever feels you'd like to answer, maybe just type right in. And let me actually unshare the screen as well. Uh, from Jack Chan, if I convert to heat pump, how does domestic hot water, how is that being handled? Do I need to install a separate electric hot water heater? So, I, yeah, I think I tried to type an answer in that one. And I guess, Loie, did you want to tackle that or I could? Oh, just that, yes, you do. Yeah need to have a, uh, a separate uh, uh, water tank. Yep. It's, not, I it's not like your current uh, combined um, heating and, and hot water system uh, doesn't work that way. 
Right. They also do make right. heat pump water heaters. So <laughs> you can get a, ah. you can get a heat pump water heater in there. And, um, you know, if you do have a basement, it adds the benefit of actually dehumidifying that space as well. Great. Um, I think I'll just kind of mix in calling on people and reading questions from the chat. And if you wanted to, uh, if you want to speak in Chinese, you can also um, just say it in Chinese and the, and the interpreters will, will jump in. Of course, I don't know what good that does for me to say that in English, but um, Eve Lee, would you like to? Yeah, hi, hey, good evening. Um, I'm curious, uh, does a, if I'm using a heat pump, does it need a supplemental heat for temperatures? So like uh, last week, you know, you get the time, so they dip to single digits. And also, how does a heat pump compares to the, um, what do you call it, uh, the, the high efficiency, those are high efficiency boiler plus the hot water heater tank mesa systems? I can take that if you want. Um, some of you guys might be more willing, you might be even better suited to this, but uh, when I was researching, apparently an air source heat pump is up to 300% efficient because it's not creating heat the way fire does. It's just moving heat around. And so it has an easier time. Um, it does start to get less efficient when it gets really cold out, but even down, I believe that most of the Mitsubishi hyperheat models, they're called cold weather heat pumps are still a hundred percent efficient below zero. Um, so they lose a little bit of their efficiency, but they're still as efficient as a gas boiler or a high efficiency oil oil burner as far as I know. Right. They can, yeah, and they, yeah. So there's, there's a few different, so NEEP, which is a Northeast. Um, wow. I can't believe I'm blanking on the <laughs> acronym at the moment. We could, we could get you a website where it does show the capacities of each different systems as they ramp down with temperature. Um, again, the efficiency remains the same. It just capacity diminishes a little bit, but it will be able to keep up. Um, I also, I just moved, but in my former home, we did put them in and it was able to keep up in, in temperatures. And as John mentioned in his home, he was able to keep that comfort level um, as needed. I, I would caveat it with, with a proper design. Yes. Um, yep. Okay. Okay. We have a couple of questions about, uh, first of all, if, the, if we lose power, does the heat pump just not work? Uh, I would imagine that's true. And someone else asked, if I have a 9,000 kilowatt generator, um, could, could that uh, power the heat pump in the I event think, of, of an outage, obviously? <laughs> right. A 9,000 9, kW system might be able to. Um, really, it depends if it's a smaller size, depending on the load. Yeah. So if it's, I think like the typically, this will get maybe too technical, but in short, likely it will not. Um, but likewise, kind of if you do have, for, for the broader question, if you had, let's say, a gas furnace or even an oil boiler, those systems would also not work because those circulator pumps stop moving water around the house and that furnace fan also does not blow that air around. So you'd be in the same scenario either way. Um, we have a question from Judy saying, I have seen prices online for far less than, this, than the, the prices that were mentioned. Uh, does, do the rebates require that people buy locally? Or could they order the unit online and get the rebate still? Well, you need to have a licensed um, uh, installer put the mechanics into your home. And most licensed installers are not going to take a piece of equipment that you've ordered online. They're going to want to supply that to you. Um, so that's the limitation of ordering a piece of equipment for yourself. Uh, I think there are a couple other factors. Um, what you see online is, pr pr I think we're talking primarily the equipment. And, and it's when the John and others were talking about the installed cost, they were talking about the equipment with the cost of, of labor, which is pretty high in Eastern Massachusetts. It just, it just is. And so uh, not only does it, you're going to have to pay somebody who's well qualified to do that, um, I guess I would caution that there's some very good installers out there, and then there are some who, who aren't as good. Um, you're better off making sure you make, uh, hire an installer who has done mass save work before. Um, they've been vetted. If they were bad, I think they would have been kicked out of the program. And then uh, certainly to be eligible for the rebate, 
not just any heat pump can get a rebate. It has to be a high quality, high efficiency uh, heating system to do that. Yeah, okay, thank that's, you. Uh, correct, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, we have a question, question from Faye. How can churches and other nonprofit institutions install heat pumps? Are there good re rebates for them? And I think I would throw in, what about small businesses? Well, the incentives will also apply to small businesses and to um, including nonprofits and houses of worship. Um, again, you can go to Mass Safe for those details. I think we're all waiting for the final uh, approval uh, where there will be more definitive information when it's finally approved. Um, I showed you a graph showing um, that there would have to be over 100,000 heat pumps installed. Those are just the residential ones. There's also a very aggressive number of business uh, heat pumps that have to be installed in businesses. So the Mass Safe program will have incentives for, uh, for businesses as well. I feel like this is like a game show. <laughs> you guys are really good with the answers from Jeopardy. <laughs> well, um, uh, question from Jack. Uh, can I keep the gas domestic hot water system while converting to whole house, uh, a whole house heat pump? I'm not, I'm not completely understanding the question, but can I keep the gas domestic hot water system while converting to a whole house heat pump? I could try to tackle that one. Um, so yeah, so this is someone who might have a boiler already that does the heating and then also the domestic hot water. So for their, for the showers and things like that. And yes, you'd be able to basically eliminate the zone for the heating. And that boiler now with the, with a tank would just be your domestic hot water. So yes, you'd be able to qualify. And some Drew asked, if you're already on natural gas heat, does the whole home incentive apply or is there a different incentive for that? Yeah, at, at present, um, the whole home does not apply to natural gas. The only incentive for natural gas, um, for heat pumps in homes that are currently heated with natural gas is a very small incentive that basically is designed to um, get natural gas homes to buy higher quality air conditioning. It's called an air conditioning uh, incentive. Um, now, at the end of January, that may change. Um, so stay tuned. Okay, thanks. Um, I saw that uh, Earl had two questions. Uh, first of all, he wanted to confirm that there are no heat pumps that can be connected to hot water baseboard system. And second question, do you all know about Rhode Island, any Rhode Island incentives? I know you're Massachusetts, so maybe you don't. But. Actually, um, our organization is based in Boston and Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and just today, uh, the governor of Rhode Island announced he's putting money in the budget for uh, heat pumps. Um, Rhode Island was lagging behind Massachusetts on uh, heat pump incentives, but we're waiting for the details. I, it was a he said he was budgeting $37 million, I think, but I don't know how that's going to break down, um, how long that will last. And I don't know how much it'll be for oil or gas customers. So um, watch if you have property in Rhode Island, uh, pay attention to what uh, that uh, to the state energy office, the OER in Rhode Island would have the de details. Thanks. And confirming that no heat pumps can be connected to hot water baseboard system. Maybe will if we could run through that. So at the moment, um, depends on the, it actually, <laughs> it gets technical, but it, it potentially could. So they do make air to water, hot, uh, sorry, air to water heat pumps. They're a little bit different uh, type of a system, but they could have a loop that ties to existing systems. The, the, the issue might be distribution of that. Um, so if there's not enough baseboard, it wouldn't work. Like a cast iron radiator wouldn't work. Um, but if there's something like a radiant tubing and flooring, it could potentially work. Um, realistically, it's it's probably not the best application and it would just be easier to add new indoor heads. Uh, we have a question from, I think, a different Jack. Um, could you talk about heat pump reliability? Um, thinking of a typical boiler furnace lasting for 20 or 30 years, I guess I personally would like to know how long do these systems last? And also how does the maintenance cause like how you know in terms of how frequently one might have to call a repair person and um i'm guessing it would be less often but um could you talk about what's about lifespan and uh, sort of reliability yeah i can i can address that as a as a heat pump user i've had one for 12 years now and um or 11 years 
and haven't had a single uh, need for um, any repair. I heard from our plumber that uh, they uh, need a lot less. <laughs> uh, I mean, it, it makes sense, right? You're not burning something there in your house uh, with moving parts that are expanding, contracting, or changing temperatures. You know, it's, I'm, I'm not an expert, but uh, does anyone else, uh, Will, or anyone else want to speak to that question? Yeah, sure. They're, yeah, they're, they're pretty low maintenance. Um, again, how long has your refrigerator been in the house? Um, really, the, the only real cleaning you kind of need to do is just keeping up with the indoor filters that come with the units. Um, they can reduce the airflow a little bit. But other than that, if you don't have too many trees around your outdoor unit, again, they stay pretty clean on their own. Um, so again, they're, they're pretty low maintenance. Again, I've, I've got, um, so we've got a couple of rented properties. Uh, we've got a few. We've put in about eight systems over the last uh, nine years. We haven't had to change any of them. So we did have one, but it was a totally unrelated issue to, to maintenance. Um, I guess this can be for anybody. Um, the question from a YouTuber, so uh, emailed in, how do heat pumps work in below freezing weather? And I guess this question could be both, can, how does it work? How do you squeeze heat out of really cold air? And also, how do they work? Like, do they, are they in, less efficient? Uh, how cold can you uh, heat your house? Like uh, down to what temperature can these function? I think uh, that's, those are important questions. Yeah, so they, sorry, the, the magic to the heat pumps is refrigerants. Um, so how they work is they basically pull in the outdoor air and inside that outdoor unit, there's a compressor. So it really just kind of forces the air into um, this refrigerant. It runs through these coils. Again, kind of like if you ever saw the back of your refrigerator, like an older refrigerator, it's got a bunch of little kind of um, aluminum veins and all that refrigerant's kind of moving in and out of those little spaces. And then again, it makes it cycle. So it brings it in, dumps off the heat in one spot, and then brings it back to the other and gets all compressed again. So it's really the, the refrigerant that's doing the work. That's how they, they pull that heat out of that air. And there's, there's Sorry, no doubt about you. it. We, we will have cold days even this year. Uh, it'll get below zero in the next couple of years. You can bet on that. But the reality is there's going to be fewer days below zero than there were when I was a kid. <laughs> right. Sorry if I missed it, but did one of you already cover um, down to what temperature they can operate? So, yeah. So I, I just remembered. So it's the Northeast. Um, energy efficiency partnerships. That's the page you would go to. But yeah, they have a bunch of systems rated to go down to minus five, minus minus fifteen degrees. Um, they can still be put out. They can still put out heat at that temperature. So yep. that that that's changed a lot. And like cause some years ago, I remember that people would say that a heat pump could only you know work down to twenty degree, fifteen, whatever it was. It wasn't that what you just mentioned. So that's great to hear. Um, I've also heard some people kind of keep their old gas system in order to, as a backup, but that doesn't even sound necessary if it will be rated down to that. Um, all right, we have a question from Nancy who wondered if um, there, you could repeat the information about the radiant floor heat. In, in some, some homes, if they've done any type of like um, renovation, they may have put in, um, it's pex so it's basically plastic tubing throughout the flooring. And in that case, if there's enough, and that's what we talk about distribution. Like if you only have a couple of cast iron radiators, there's not enough um, distribution. So in a, in a place where you do have a lot, um, you've got a lot of this too big in place, you could use uh, potentially an air to water system because now that, that temperature is delivered at a lower temperature, but it would be enough distribution to get the heat out of that tubing into the house, if that helps explain it. Uh, there have been several questions about the electrical service into your house. Um, first of all, is 100 amp okay? Do you need 200 amps, 400 amp? What if you also have an electric car and um, a couple of other things? So that's one question of how much amperage do you need? And then secondly, do the incentives cover the electrical upgrade to a bigger um, electrical system amperage? I don't think the Mass Save program currently is offering that. I think you might be able to get a heat loan that might cover that cost. You do. Um, that's a, a zero or low interest loan you can get through MassSave. Uh, maybe Loie or Will can speak to that. I'll put in a, a, uh, a hope though, the uh, Biden administration has proposed a, a package called Build Back Better, we've heard of that um, is struggling to get through Congress. Uh, that would have 
um, large federal tax credits for heat pumps, and it would have uh, pretty good incentives for upgrading the electrical panel in your home uh, to go to 200 amps. Whether you had a heat pump or electric cars, uh, you could do that. But uh, what I'm hearing is that may pass in a few months, but n not not immediately. I could add to that. I mean, our house is not state of the art. <laughs> we, it, I think we have a hundred amp service, and that's split between two units. We don't even get the full hundred, um, and they didn't have to do any upgrades on our house in order to service it. There, I think we have. 18,000 BTUs, like one and a half ton. They're, they're not, you know, enormous uh, units, but they're still pretty powerful. All right. Here's a question from Dan saying, I replaced uh, an aged oil furnace and air conditioner with relatively high efficiency unit three years ago for a heat slash air duct system. So in other words, just upgraded three years ago. Does it make sense to make a switch realizing there isn't going to be an even cost swap? Or is there some index of age for an existing system? I got it's kind of hard to read it if it makes sense. But I think if you've just, if you're upgraded fairly recently, does this still make sense in some way? I think that's the question, right? Uh, Claire, could you remind me again, does he name what his fuel source is? Was it gas or oil? The way I read it was he, he, had an oil system and replaced it with a higher efficiency oil system. Is that what I'm, that's how I interpret it. Or Dan could speak up also. Yeah. He said well, yes in the chat. Well, in either case, if you've just invested in new equipment, it probably won't make sense to uh, replace that new equipment. Um, this is going to be you know, a, a process of decades to, to convert everybody into heat pumps. And so you might be better suited to at least get um, 10 or, or 12 years out of your, your investment uh, before you attempt to replace it. That would be just off the cuff, my assumption. Yes, I, I would say all of us should be thinking ahead. If, if we're not going to get a heat pump in 2022, um, I'll, I'll give you a prediction that, the, that um, oil companies and the gas company will be strongly encouraged by the state and that there will be incentives available where um, when if your heating system is older not like Dan's if it's if it's older you really might want to think ahead about trying to um, uh, you know watch it if it becomes inefficient make the switch if it becomes costly to repair the oil or gas system make a switch uh, that kind of thing but uh, think about heat pumps um, in advance because it's uh, you don't want to be trying to get it done uh, in the middle of January if the old system breaks down. Okay, great. Uh, we have a question from Gramps <laughs> um, saying, what is the best guess on when the 2022 incentives will be finalized? They are supposed to be done the end of the month, uh, but it's the state agency that can decide when it finishes the work. And I, I'd be surprised if it uh, went past February. Um, so you could start, wa watch that mass save uh, website very carefully. Eve, Eve asked, are heat pump systems with mini split, will, will heat pump system with mini split work well in an older building where there, is, there are a lot of small rooms? I guess this is partly about air circulation. Um, and I, I would have that question too, like how many on like a, sort of average medium small Quincy type house like on one floor would you tend to have like one or two or about how many of those units and does the air circulate okay if a, a room a house has lots of small rooms? I can tell you that so we just installed the, the one blower and we have one two three bedrooms on one side of the house a kitchen that is separated and then the dining room and living room. We just have the one unit in the dining room and living room. And when it's in like November, say, when it's 40 degrees out, um, there's only like a two degree difference between out in the main living area and the bedrooms. It's It really circulates quite well. Um, and that's actually nice to have the bedrooms a little bit cooler. Uh, it's more pronounced now that it's colder. It is harder to heat those far off rooms, you know, coming from the central area. We did get a quote to get individual, you know, one heat pump outside and then like five different blowers, one in the kitchen, one out here, one in each bedroom. Uh, 
And it was, that was just exorbitant. It was the difference between 9,000 and 27,000. So uh, that was just too much. Uh, there are other creative ways. I think you could tap into the attic or, or just, they didn't give us a whole ton of options and I should have asked for more sort of variables, but um, like I had one guy explain to me that you could just sit one in a closet between two bedrooms and have it feeding out to both. Right. So you only, you, you only need one extra unit in that case to service two bedrooms. Um, so there are sort of creative ways, I think, to manage multiple rooms. Because I can imagine with bedrooms, there's an additional problem that you, if you want the door closed, obviously the air isn't going to circulate as well. And yeah, this is with bedroom doors open and stuff. Yeah. Can you install a heat pump in an attic? You can, depending on the type. <laughs> Again, I know it's one of those kind of uh, vague answers, but if um, they do condense, so if you have water, um, I mean, it, it depends kind of on the season too, but um, you obviously don't want anything to freeze if it's up in the attic. If you're doing a ducted system, then that's easy. Yes, that would just go up there. Uh, but again, you'd want to kind of work through that kind of scenario with your uh, HVAC contractor. I just want to quickly share one of our QCAM members um, mentioned this product that is has not out yet, but um, hopefully you can see that. But it's coming sometime it's a a window type unit that um a, a homeowner could install themselves where the um the uh you know outside the window hangs the, the exterior unit and inside it's a, it's a heat pump that does both will do both air conditioning and heating and i think it looks pretty sharp and um it doesn't block the window from being able to be opened or blocking the light coming in so um it could be great for um both heating and cooling. And it seems to me you could make a modest, you know, just do one of these or something. And I don't know if Larry or Lo, if you know anything, whether, I mean, these aren't even out yet. And, but do you think any incentives would help cover those? I, I think like they'll that? have to prove to Mass Save that they're um, efficient in, in terms of using the energy uh, efficiently because the, the object of the game at Mass Save is to reduce uh, heating load and to um, uh, do it efficiently and reduce greenhouse gases, and so they'll 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 have to apply. I'm sure they'd have to apply and compete with uh, existing products to get there. Will may have something I'm sure to say about that. Yeah, yeah, okay. sure, yeah. So all the systems that are eligible now, they have to be third party rated. The idea there is that they're not just going to take the manufacturer's word for it. They want a third party rating. So I mentioned that that NEEP cold uh, climate air resource list. That's again, a third party doing testing on those systems on their own. Um, also the, it's called the AHRI. So it's the Air Conditioning, Heating, Refrigeration Institute. They rate these systems as well. So again, you're just kind of um, really, we don't really worry about what the brand is, who the manufacturer is. We just look for, has it been rated by a third party? That design is very exciting in terms of thinking about that that um, that green bar that went up so steeply to to meet our needs in in Massachusetts for getting rid of uh, uh, fossil fuel heat. So those systems are promising, but they're not at all commercially available. And as as Will mentioned, you know they have to go through the the testing and rating and and all the quality all the um, quality control stuff. Um, but it's promising, um, Jack wanted to know if the low temperature rating for heat pumps takes into account the windshield factor. Wind chill factor. I don't think it does. No, I, not that I'm aware of. No, I don't think it does. It would be, they test these in, in kind of lab settings. And then, so there's no real, I guess. Yeah, that's a no. good point. So the rate, in other words, <laughs> yeah. the rating, if the wind chill, if it's like five, you know, negative 10 with the wind chill factor, can, can these systems heat up, keep up or, can they only keep up, you know, I think that might be the question. Right. Yeah. No, I don't. Rated to a certain temperature. Yeah. Right. Thank you all so much for your uh, really great answers. I'm really impressed. I want to thank our translators and our partners. <laughs>